Thank you very much indeed, Dahi, Mari, and to everybody. Let me start by wishing you all a very happy new year, and in particular by wishing every success to the Irish presidency, which is already in, on day three of the uh, uh, Irish leadership of, at the helm of the Council of Ministers. Um, I'm going to start my remarks by referring back to the 10th of December last year when I was in Oslo, when the European Union was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, for all of us who work on European affairs, it was a very, very moving uh, moment, uh, particularly because the EU is going through such a difficult time. It was wonderfully motivating to have the international recognition of what the EU project stands for, not uh, for the day-to-day -day difficulties and battles that we face, but what the whole project stands for. And I was very struck by what the chair of the Nobel Committee uh, said. Uh, he said that the EU cannot be taken as a given. It's something that has to be struggled for every day. And believe me, it is a struggle every day. But uh, on a moment like that, when um, the international community is saying, we want the European project to succeed, we believe that uh, the contribution it has made to peace in the world is hugely important. That is, uh, I think, a moment that um, will certainly stay in my memories um, uh, to, to, to the end of my life. Uh, but saying that the EU is not a given, that you can't take it for granted, is, is very true. Because the EU is an unfinished project. It's not a journey to a known or agreed destination, and once you get there, then you can say it's complete. It's much more something that's evolving over time, and that has to respond to what Europe needs now and in the future, as much as having been built on what Europe needed in the past uh, and, sec and uh, when it was, the whole project was started after the Second World War. I think it's especially true at the current time because, uh, in fact, a new EU is being fashioned out of the crisis that we're going through. The way I see it is that the complacency that we had for the last 15 or 20 years has been swept away. I think we thought we could stay at a point where we had something between national decision-making and a little bit of EU as an add-on. I think that has been swept away. It's now clear that that's not possible. And it's only now that the real consequences for many member states of being in a currency union are actually being understood. Today, I think we're also at a moment when uh, what we all took for granted as the irreversibility of the EU is also being seriously questioned. And that's for the first time in a long time. Uh, some will not wish to integrate further, and some even think that they have a choice still about not integrating further. But I think that we will live for the next several years in a period of transition, having outgrown uh, the way that we were before the crisis, but not yet having grown into the shape of how the union will be in the future. If we look back on what's happened in the last four years, huge decisions have been taken during the crisis. To give the EU, EU um, a fund to intervene when member states get into difficulty that we never had before, to completely overhaul the financial uh, sector, the regulation of the financial sector, to give the EU a bigger say ex ante in national budget and policy making. And these were big decisions that were taken in the heat of the crisis because they had to be taken. But they were big decisions that I think are still not well understood. I would say not even fully understood by everyone who participated in taking them, and certainly not uh, fully understood uh, by the general public. And I'll come back to the problem that that creates in a moment. But I think that it's clear that even though huge decisions have been taken, it isn't enough. Um, and it's not enough for one very simple reason. National decision-making cannot and does not take into account the real interdependence, uh, particularly of countries that are in a common currency uh, union, but I would say even of the interdependence between all member states of the European Union. And we have seen graphically the impact that bad policy making in one part of the union can have on all of the rest of the union. So it's clear that we cannot go on uh, with the belief that national uh, decision making and economic policy is enough. It can't be left to the national level alone. But we're not yet at a point where we have um, a level of EU decision taking that is in keeping with a common currency. And so that's an inherently unstable point. And my conclusion from that analysis would be that we have to go forward, and I would say inevitably, to a deeper level of integration. Um, I think it's very clear 
that the new EU that I spoke about emerging from the crisis is going to be built around the euro. And I think that for two reasons. One is because it's, it's the currency of the union, that's what the treaty says. We have two member states that have an opt-out. At the moment, we have 17 in the euro, 10 not in the euro, but most of those who are not in the euro want to and will join. So that's not going to um, be a, a stable state for too long. Um, but the second reason why I believe that the new union um, will be built around the euro is because it's existential. Uh, the euro, the political decision is clearly taken that the euro will survive because we will do everything that it needs, uh, that has to be done to make it survive. Um, and we cannot afford not to do it. So for those two reasons, the euro will be the core of the future EU. Uh, and I think it's important um, that we see it in that way because it's a key to understanding a lot of the decisions that are going to be taken in the next few years. I think we are beginning to convince not only ourselves but um, the wider world that the euro is irreversible. Greece will not leave and will not be thrown out of the euro. I think London has gone from worrying about what, how to cope with the breakdown of the euro to how to cope with the survival of the euro. And that's a whole different uh, ball game. Because now the question is, uh, what will be the impact of a strong euro in the future? And where will it have its financial centre? I think convincing everyone that the euro is irreversible is a very important part of breaking the link between bank debt and sovereign debt. And that has been the issue that has bedeviled uh, Ireland and other parts of the Union in this current crisis. We need to do a lot more to put the right policies and instruments in place to regain confidence and to get back to growth. But I think that uh, from uh, everything that has been decided in the last few years, you can see that the political decision has been, and we have followed through on that, that the leaders of the European Union will do whatever it takes uh, to support the euro in the future. This means that the next steps uh, in integration will uh, be to put a banking union in place for the euro. Now, a very important decision was made uh, by the Council of Ministers just before the Christmas uh, to set up a single supervisor for the euro area. That should then be followed by um, agreement on a single resolution mechanism, which in simple terms means that the banks and the shareholders will have to pay in future to bail out the banks, not the taxpayers. And the third leg of a, of a long-term banking union uh, will be, and this I say with much more caution, um, a common deposit guarantee mechanism. I think that even those who are calling for that kind of mechanism at the moment haven't really factored in the degree of intrusion in domestic decision-making that would be required before some governments will agree to that level of debt neutralisation. But that's the kind of scenario of um, what a banking union would be made up of. And we need to do this because uh, if you look back, you can see that we were not well prepared for the crisis when it hit. We didn't have the instruments in place, the ones I talked about a moment ago. This is now being remedied, of course, but we also need a vision for the future. Uh, we need to have some sense of where we're going. And that's why in November, the Commission published uh, what we called a blueprint on economic and monetary union. Um, I think it's important that I say that we're not asking anyone to adopt this blueprint. It's, it's the Commission's view of where we should go, what needs to be done in order to build economic and monetary union. But although we're not asking people to adopt it, I think it will be a reference point for years to come because it's a very uh, thorough piece of work setting out what the next steps should be, uh, what, uh, what can be done under the current treaty, what cannot be done under the current treaty and will require treaty change in the future. Not uh, for another few years, I hope, <laughs> but uh, certainly in the future. I think it's also um, interesting to see that the report that uh, the President of the European Council, President Van Rompuy, brought out um, in December is very compatible <coughs> with the Commission's blueprint. Um, they're very largely um, going in the same direction. And uh, his report was done, of course, working very closely with the Commission, but also with the ECB. So you can see that the main European institutions of the euro are all thinking um, in the same direction, thinking along the same lines. Now, having said that, it's also very clear that most governments uh, are still thinking short term and are not ready to sign up to big long term visions, at least not, not right now. I think the December European Council showed very clearly that member states need time to digest uh, what they have already decided. They feel, uh, they feel they've done a lot, and they have. Um, and they're hoping now that the pace will slow down a little bit 
Um, I'm not sure that that's uh, uh, going to be a hope that will be fulfilled. I think there is a danger of complacency. As soon as the pressure from the markets has lessened, people feel, oh, we don't have to make these difficult decisions. Let's just sort of slow everything down. And I think if we don't show um, that we are determined to continue and to put in place the instruments, the mechanisms, the policies, and the way of deciding together that we need, then the markets will, will lose faith again and will punish us again. Um, but having said that the member states are not prepared to sign up now uh, to a big uh, future vision, they are willing to take the next steps because I think their, their collective experience of the crisis has been that we have got to continue to put in place uh, the policies and the instruments that we need. And so I think um, what the Commission tried to do in the blueprint, what President Van Rempe has done in his report, is to set out the next steps and their sequencing so that we do things in the right order, that people know what's coming next, and that they can see individual proposals in a wider context of leading towards eventual uh, full economic and monetary union. And um, I have to say I have a lot of understanding for um, the heads of state and government who feel that it's been uh, very intense for years uh, and that they would like a bit more breathing space. I think one of the um, unfortunate side effects of the, of the uh, drama and the focus um, almost exclusively on uh, saving the euro has been that we have, um, it has absorbed almost all the political time and energy. And there hasn't been uh, the attention needed to the growth agenda. And I'm hoping that um, as the situation is stabilizing now, that that same energy and uh, determination can be put into the growth agenda. It will be a long haul. Um, unemployment levels go up very quickly, but they come down very slowly. Uh, and there's no money around for stimulus packages. You can see in uh, each member state, but also you can see at European level, the difficulty we are having in fixing the next uh, financial perspective, which is still only going to be about 1% of EU GDP, but the difficulties around agreeing on that show that there is not going to be money around for stimulus packages. So we will have to find the political will to continue to invest in structural reform to create the opportunities uh, that we need to, to get <coughs> Europe growing again. And I, there is an ongoing need for deep structural reform whether it be in education and training, in skills, in matching um, what people learn to what the marketplace needs, to investing in research, to investing in clean energy, all of the things that, that everybody can think of. Um, we have to find the political will to open up the opportunities that are there in order to get Europe growing again. Um, I think another area where it's obvious that Europe has to find the political will is to conclude new international trade agreements. Um, they are always difficult. It's very uh, difficult for 27, soon 28 countries to have exactly an identity of interest uh, and to be able to conclude the agreements, but it's clear that a lot of future European growth is going to come from outside of the European uh, Union. So uh, these are just some of the areas where I think we need to continue to find the political will to invest in, in the growth uh, for the future. And that's going to come to my last point. Um, I think that we can find um, the political and the economic uh, uh, skills and um, policies that we need. But the biggest questions that the union faces are, of course, the political ones. Um, and we need to answer difficult questions in the next two to three years. The biggest difficulty, I think, is going to be uh, finding the right answer to how can we keep the EU together. How can we handle faster integration by some member states, those that are in the euro, but not all, because not all want, have an obligation or want to be in the euro? How can we, um, how can we handle this? I think the, the current debate in the UK and with the UK is something that everybody is following very closely. I think that there are some promising signs that business in the UK is beginning also to say, well, hang on a minute, you know, um, don't we need to think this through uh, in, a lot, in, a, in a deeper way and more rationally? Um, and I think we need to manage that situation very carefully and not to um, have any uh, uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. I touched on a moment ago the question of the political will that we need to make the deep structural change that Europe needs uh, to be able to, to not only survive in the age of globalization, but to come out uh, strong in, in, that, in the era in which we live. Will we be able to find the collective determination to keep making those changes once the fierce heat of the crisis has abated somewhat? These are, these are political questions, they're not technical. Um, 
And perhaps the biggest question of all is, how are we going to persuade our fellow EU citizens that a further transfer of sovereignty to the EU level is in their interest? Um, I think part of the debate that's coming will have to be about power sharing between the EU level and the national level. Um, I think that we will have to look again at whether we've got the right balance of what's decided at EU level and what's decided nationally. Um, and I think that um, we have to have a debate about what, do we, what kind of EU do we want. Um, at the moment, the European Union is getting a lot more uh, and tougher powers on the economic side. Do we want the EU and the EU institutions only to be the police? So to sit in judgment on what member states are doing and to meet out the punishment when they don't do what they've committed to. Um, but if we want the EU to be uh, involved in a wider range of policies than that, then we will have to have a debate about how do we want the EU and to what extent do we want the EU involved in policies like social policy, health policy, education policy. All of these are intensely political and, uh, and public issues. And I, I'm struck by the um, public comment here um, and in other programme countries um, on the involvement of the Troika. And there's a lot of, a lot of criticism, a lot of resentment. Um, that shows that this will not be an easy debate to have in, in the coming years, but we will have to have it. And then the question of um, how can we ensure greater democratic accountability and legitimacy? We will have to find the right way to connect with the population. And the population we're talking about is 500 million people, so it's not easy to connect with them as individuals. Um, we will have to make sure that we have accountability at the right level. Um, it's easy to say that when things are decided at EU level, the accountability should be at EU level, and when they're national, they should be national. But defining that clearly in a way that the public understands and supports is not, is not going to be simple. Of course, out of all of this, I think there inevitably will be uh, an even greater role for the European Parliament. But there's also a big question about what then is the role of national parliaments and how can they be involved um, in uh, that mix of EU level policy making, national policy making, and where the two come together. So I think there is a need for an informed debate and a debate which will be as profound in its own way as the decision Ireland took 40 years ago to join the European Union and the decision that Ireland took when it joined the precursor of what became the Euro. And that debate will also have to include serious discussions about the alternative, because it's very easy to say, oh, we don't want any more of that, we don't want any more integration, no, no, we have enough, thanks very much. But, so what's the alternative? Um, my basic thesis is that we can't stay where we are now, we have to go deeper. So how do we bring people along with us to understand that and support it, and, and, and not feel that something is being taken away, but rather that something additional is being gained? Um, and I think that that is a debate that is, has to be had. It wasn't had during the heat of the crisis because all the attention was absorbed on making the decisions. Now those decisions have to be explained to the public. People have to feel comfortable with them and ready to move on to the next level. And that's where I just wanted to say a few words to close about the Irish presidency. I think that um, it is highly symbolic that Ireland takes up um, the presidency 40 years to the day after we joined as a very different country with very high hopes of what EU membership would bring and hopes which I think have, have been very largely um, delivered if not surpassed. Um, now is a difficult time, but if you look back over 40 years, um, all of us who are old enough to have been adult at the time uh, remember what a different country Ireland was and how much more um, confidence uh, and uh, possibilities we have uh, now that we, that we didn't have then. And I think that the presidency will put a spotlight on Ireland. I know that that's the determination of, of the government and the civil service, is to really showcase um, what Ireland can do. Ireland coming back out of a programme um, and, and making a very big success of its presidency. And there are very high hopes for the Irish presidency in, in Brussels as well. Um, we've always had successful presidencies. The seventh one, I'm sure, will be the most successful of all. Um, and people look for um, a particular Irish style of efficiency and drive and um, at the same time respect for all member states, big and small. And I think that Ireland, the Irish presidency, can actually make a difference uh, to the growth agenda I was talking about. There are quite a lot of proposals on the table of the council and the parliament that need a push. Uh, these opportunities that I was talking about, which don't cost money, um, but which can open opportunities if decisions are taken, I think that's where the Irish presidency of different councils 
and the Irish interaction as presidency with the European Parliament can actually try to build a momentum and a feeling that, yes, we're coming out of the crisis, growth can return, this can be the year when the momentum comes back. So um, I look forward, um, of course, particularly to seeing um, the home team playing um, every day in Brussels. But I think that there's a, there's a particular contribution that Ireland can make now. They can't solve all the problems, of course, but they can, they can set a different rhythm of different expectations and put growth and, and, uh, and coming back to uh, a better time um, at the heart of the agenda. So to conclude, um, let me just uh, briefly say the following. Of course it will take years for Europe to come fully out of this crisis. It took years to build up. Uh, it can't be undone overnight. We will not go back to where we were before the crisis. Uh, no matter how often I say that, I'm still surprised by the number of people who think that we will. We will not. We will be in a different world. I think you will see gradually uh, a newly shaped up and a stronger European Union emerge. It will be more integrated. It, that deeper integration will be built around the euro. We will have to have a more clear division between what's decided at EU level, what's decided nationally. And it will not be straightforward progress. It's not going to be one step after the other. It's going to be more of a zigzag and a lurch every now and again. But I think the direction of travel is clear. I think that um, it's clear also that more responsibility will have to go hand in hand with more, more solidarity. And that requires a, a public uh, political debate about what kind of EU do we want to have in the future. At some point, we will come to the conclusion that we have to change the treaty. But that should be preceded by a debate about what kind of EU do we want to have. It should not be a technical, legal, uh, constitutional debate. The treaty should be the transference into legal and constitutional terms of the outcome of that debate. And we should get it the right way around this time round. First of all, have the debate and then put it into a treaty, not start by saying we need to change the treaty. Uh, and so what are we going to um, put in it? I don't think that there will be um, a treaty change process before 2015, but that's not that far away. Uh, I think that we can take a lot of the decisions we have to take in the coming uh, months and years under the existing treaty, but at some stage in the future, uh, in order to, to go further with it, the kind of integration that I think will be required, we will have to change the treaty in the future. And for that to happen, there really has to be um, a well-informed public debate, not only here in Ireland, but in lots of other countries where, where there will also be referenda. So I'll conclude by saying I think it's an absolutely fascinating time for Ireland to be at the helm. I think uh, I look forward very much to seeing Irish ministers, Irish civil servants chairing, compromising, wheeler dealing in the way that uh, only we can do. And uh, I look forward, if you do invite me back at some stage in the future, maybe to doing a retrospective of the Irish presidency. Thank you very much.